we lost a turnover battle, two on the first half, and we give up a seven yard run and we're down by four. Like, the way y'all play against Philly and the way we play sometimes, if we can combine it, bro, I promise there's no team that can beat us. So just know that. So, you know, see y'all boys on Wednesday. Yes, no, hey, y'all <laughs> too. Washington football. Woo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. Reed is not here yet. He will be here momentarily. Welcome to the Burgundy Zone. This episode is the Red, White, and Dub. The Commanders went up to New England, and they brought back a dub from the Patriots, winning 20-17. to 17. And the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. So we thought we'd bring in our friend of this podcast, a family member, a brother, probably the best baker that we have here, and Zach Selby, to be able to talk about this victory. Fantastic Monday that we have. How are you doing, Zach? Doing all right. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done a whole lot of baking recently. I did make some Halloween cookies the other day. But um, other than that, you know, it's been it's been pretty chill and focused more on the team, actually. And like you said, it's really good to get a win. I mean, the last couple of weeks have been tough sledding, uh, especially yeah. after, you know, losing some close ones to the Eagles and, well, really two close ones to the Eagles. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be back in the win column. And hopefully, you know, this 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 year's November is, is a lot like last year's November, where they go on a little bit of a run, and you're in the thick of the playoff hunt. Yeah, and then speaking of you uh, making Halloween cookies, I'm sure you gave some some trick or treaters and dropping those cookies into the bucket, like Sam Howell did to Jahan Dotson on a 33 yard strike down the field. That was absolutely beautiful. That being mm-hmm. said, Selby, what was the biggest difference? play in this game that really separated I guess you could say down to the wire was a Quan Martin interception not to answer the question for you but it was such a back and forth game it's hard to really pinpoint I mean yeah like the Quan Martin interception for sure but I think the biggest thing that I noticed is that Washington was was able to recover from its mistakes that was I think that was a big difference between previous weeks I mean just go back to last week against the Eagles I mean they had so many I mean, Terry McLaurin with the drops, you had the interception, you had, you know, the catch that wasn't a catch from Dotson. You had a lot of, like, critical mistakes that just they could never really climb out of for whatever reason. And here, you know, they had a lot of the same mistakes where they had a fumble inside their own territory. Then Sam Howe throws the ugly interception. Um, but and, nor- and normally, like, we've seen them go down 14-10 in a lot of other games this year, and they just don't come out of it at all. Right. So, but other, unlike that, they didn't let themselves get too get too low. They responded by putting up ten points and taking the lead, uh, and pretty much just sitting on it for the rest of the game. I mean, they didn't really do a whole lot after that touchdown um, or after that field goal uh, from from Joey Sly. But you know, they 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 were able to bleed the clock a little bit. The defense held its own enough uh, to keep the score as what as what it was. Um, big thing I really want to see from them next is I want to see them put a team away. Like that, yeah. that's that, that was the most frustrating thing about, about that game is like, they should have been out <laughs> by two touchdowns, I would say. And for, you know, they just, for some reason, they just could not sustain a drive. And it's like for, for most of the second half and thank, thankfully the defense was able to, you know, keep them and keep them, keep the lead intact. But you look at that offense, you're like, man, like you, you had a chance there to, 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 to actually win a game that wasn't uh, like behind, wasn't like three points or less. So like you had a chance to really impose your will on a team and really say you're not you're not coming out of this game, you're not coming back. And they could not quite do that. Now, I still got the win, so a win's a win. But at the same time, like you you still need to see them come out there and and put together four quarters, which is again something they haven't really successfully been able to do for most of this year. Yeah, and that's what John Allen said in his post-game speech to the team, and he's absolutely right. But that being said, Selby, imagine this. 
The Commanders dominated the time of possession, 37 minutes and 10 seconds, compared to New England, who had only 22 minutes and 50 seconds of possession, and the score was only 20 to 17, which is absolutely crazy. Sorry, Hall. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and it wasn't a, a run fest like it usually used to right. be whenever we would dominate the time of possession like that. So that's definitely a good thing. But um, another thing that I noticed from yesterday was Emmanuel Forbes was out there on the field making plays. Uh, should have had an interception, but it looked like it was should have been offensive pass interference. But, hey, you know, he still has a couple more games to uh, get some more picks in there. But uh, what, were you, what did you see from Emmanuel yesterday and – do you think he'll be able to kind of stack that and build on that going into Seattle where obviously they have a much better wide receiver core than what New England put out there on Sunday? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the thing that I noticed from him the most, like he seemed a lot more confident in himself, right? And I mean, you go through that, – that was a tough few weeks for him, right? I mean, you, you, get, you get a tough welcome to the NFL lesson from A.J. Brown. You give up a touchdown again to him uh, in the second matchup against the Eagles. Goals. You have a tough tough day against the, the Bears, um, you know, receiving core and their pass catchers. Uh, yeah, it was it was tough for him. But I think sitting him down for a little bit, while not always ideal for a first round pick, right? Like it is, it can be beneficial because we're talking about a long term development here. And it seemed like he had a better knowledge of the system, and it seemed like he was playing more to himself. I think that was that was a big key for him because look, check this out. He had. He was targeted seven times. Like, the, the Patriots were, were trying to go after him. Only allowed two catches for 12 yards. Like, and two and two pass breakups. Like, that, that's that's a, that's a good day for any defensive back. And, you know, confidence, it plays such a big role in that position. I mean, Francis Smith will tell you, you know, he's one of the most confident people I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why he was, you know, a pretty solid player for most of his career is because <laughs> he was able to be so confident. And I, I, think, I think a game like this is a good – it's a good thing for Emmanuel because it shows him that he he still belongs. He he was tackling better too. I think I noticed that about him as well. He was not afraid to be physical, you know, at or behind the line of scrimmage. So yeah, like I think it's a good little layup win for him to kind of build on as he goes to some of these tougher tougher opponents. Because like you said, the Seahawks with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, like they've got some quality guys out there, and we'll we'll see how it goes for him. But yeah, like I think it's a good it's a good step in the right direction. Yeah, let's, now let's talk about the most interesting aspect of this game yesterday. Sam Howell, he was 29 of 45, 64% completion percentage, 325 yards thrown, one touchdown, an 84 quarterback rating, had five carries for 27 yards. We all go back to that 23-yard run that he had to be able to get the first down on third down. But that being said, they were 9 of 17 on third down, Selby. That's incredible, thinking that it's not just because they had limited second down to being a bunch of third and threes. These were long third downs. So talk about Sam Howell and him on third down yesterday primarily. Yeah, I mean, his his performances on third down might have honestly been some of the best performances that he's had all year because, you know, we've, we've been waiting for this for Sam, right? We've we've seen the good games, and then we've seen games like the Bills and the Giants where it's like, I don't know – what you're doing out there, bud? Like you, know, you're not. You don't look like the same guy that was out there against the Eagles. But it seems like he's learning now to start, like to stack days, and that that I mean that's big, you know, especially in this time of the year when they got to start winning games and make a playoff push. He looks like, like the protection. The protection has I think has played a pretty big role in that. Uh, with Tyler Larson and Chris Paul out there doing a very good job, I think that it helped calm him a little bit. I don't think it's coincidence that like since with those two players in there that he's. He's been he's been sacked a lot less. He seems more comfortable. He doesn't seem like he's going into freak out mode uh, as much as as much as he has as much as he was like in previous weeks. Uh, but yeah, I think he's he has his arm bring it downfield. I think that was a that was something that we've always seen from him. Um, and I think I think having the the passes that are closer to the line of scrimmage, you know, shows that he it builds with his confidence. So that when you need to take those shots, you're not afraid to just sling in there whenever you need to. Because he had Yami Brown for. Pretty big catch. He had uh, Byron Pringle out there for a couple of really, really nice catches, and then there was the there was a catch and run for Terry McLaurin. I mean, those are those Dude. are all like, really good pa- like passes. And I mean, let, I mean, we can also talk about the uh, the the play he had to to uh, Jahan Dawson because that was put. I mean, I, I when I saw it play in action, I didn't think he was going to get anything. He was going to catch it. I think he was going to be overthrown or something. But uh, he put it exactly where Jahan needed it to be, and he came down there, just dropped it in the bucket. So. I mean, look, Sam Howell's second in the league in passing yards right now. And I know some people, 
I tweeted that out this morning, and then people just like went crazy because they're like, "Yeah, hey, he's throwing the ball like you know forty times a game and everything, and he's hey, they're down a lot and everything." Like, yeah, 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 sure, absolutely. <laughs> but not like this offense is like they're trusting him, a young quarterback with ten starts to throw the ball 40, 50 times a game, like, and he's and he's not screwing like he's screwing up for he's not screwing up for the most part like that. Like there's two different ways to look at it, and I think that is a more positive growth that you can actually throw the ball 50 times a young quarterback and still, you know, do what you need to do. Like that, that doesn't happen very often. No. And and the funny thing I would say to people saying that about Sam Howell is look at Alex Smith when he was here, when we, after we had traded for him, if you were to ask him to sit back, go throw for 40 times, would he be putting up these kind of numbers and making those types of plays? And that's <coughs> a veteran quarterback. And the obvious answer is no. And it kind of tells you I the kind of level he's playing. The amount of times that, that Alex went through the ball more than 35 times a game, I, I don't think you can count it on. I, I, it's probably more than like 20 times, but I bar- I guarantee you it's not much more than that. Like there's just there's, – <laughs> especially with the time in Washington. There's just no way. Even if that many attempts, Zach, there, he's probably not putting up those sort of numbers that Sam is in that no. regard. Yeah. And I love a lot of no. respect no. for Alex Smith. Think, but... think about this too is when is the – yes, like no matter how he's getting there – I mean, like, when is the last time a Washington quarterback has been this high in the in the pa- in passing yard rankings? Like, in in any point in the regular season, probably Kirk. But like, yeah. even then, like, well, you could probably give me like an exact week. I mean, it's been at least twenty eighteen since he's thrown for that. Since the Washington quarterback has thrown for that many yards at this point in the season, like that's 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 like that that is a good sign of a quarterback's development. I don't care how many times he has to throw the ball because they're showing you that, hey, they don't care either. If they win, who cares? That's exactly what I was saying in our one group chat uh, with the Take Command guys is, look, like, like, can everyone just be happy for the first time in our literal lives? We actually might have a legit quarterback here. Just be happy, <laughs> all right? But to, uh, before we wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions for you. Reed, do you have anything you would like to ask Selby before he gets out of here? Well, Kyle, it's kind of hard when I don't know what was asked, so I just want to sit here and listen to him well, and just admire him because he's a beautiful well, you man. Should have been here, okay. Well, <laughs> you know, sometimes a working man's got to work. We can't just, you know, sit here and, and lollygag all day. I I, I need to Semantics. work. I'm just kidding. Semantics. <laughs> Semantics. Uh, but I sit and lollygag all day. Uh, like, to wrap this up, Sal, we only have a couple more questions for you, but a broad kind of general-looking question from a bird's-eye view. What did we learn about the commanders yesterday? <sighs> What did we learn? That is a, that is a loaded question yeah. <laughs> that I'm going to try to answer as quickly as I can. I mean, I think there's, I think the biggest thing you learn is that like, they're not, they're not out of it yet. Like they're still fighting for this. They're still resilient. They're still, they still think they've got a chance this year. I mean, if you think about it, like they're, they're one game back for the wild card spot, the last wild card spot. And if they go through the runs, like they could take a they realistically get it. So um, yeah, they're still resilient. I think a lot of people thought that whenever they traded for traded away Chase Young and Montez Sweat, they were kind of punting on the season. They said, "Nah, we're we're still gonna win. We're still gonna try to do whatever we can to get in the playoffs." And I think that's that's the biggest thing. I think that's also an encouraging sign for this team too. I agree with you there. Next question I have for you, Jamin Davis and his progression as a linebacker. What have you seen? You know, it's been kind of up and down because I I saw him get you know so get a lot of see a couple a couple of receivers get behind him against the Patriots uh but at the same time he makes a really good play um against Stevenson gets get gets a couple steps behind Stevenson and then he makes up the ground and gets a nice third down uh PBU so it's a little bit hot and cold here and there I think um but he's still got the athleticism he's still got the development I mean he's he's coming along I think is I think is the big thing that you can say and I, and I know like, not having Cody Barton out there like that's probably gonna be tough for him because that's a that's a starter out there. That's your that's your Mike linebacker. So he's doing a little bit of a little bit of everything right now. But I think you see the more I think you see more consistency out of him, which is again, it's a good sign. I mean, now you really you want to see that out of a first round pick that's in his you know third year, but at the same time, like you you, you take you take the the positives whenever you can get them. I'm with you. The last question I have for you, Selby, from one lineman to another. Uh, we've seen the trenches. We kind of seen how the O line kind of works in a very dumbed down, very uh, lack of talented way. But what do you what do you attribute the progression of the offensive line? The kind of the lack of sacks because I don't think it's as easy as saying it's the replacement of Gates and Charles. I think a lot more has to do with it. So from your point of view, what do you think that that success is attributed to? I mean, I think it's it's you're right. It's not just 
the fact that Larson and, and Paul are in there. Although I think that definitely does help. I think they add a lot more, you know, like weight in the interior. I think that that does help. But I also think, you know, Sam is learning how to get the ball out quicker too. I think that is also helping. I think you're also seeing him, you know, I think you're seeing the enemy learn how to call plays more for the system. I think you're seeing the receivers getting open a little bit more. It's kind of like, it's kind of like in the reverse where like, why are they getting sacked so many times? There's not just like kind of one culprit. It's like, the same thing here. It's like, well, why, why, why are they getting it fixed now? And I don't think there's one specific reason why. I think, yes, it's the offensive line is playing better. I think Sam's getting the ball out quicker. I think the play calling is getting better. I think the last two weeks have probably been the enemy's like, best games, in, in my opinion. Um, so it's, it's probably the mixture of those three. But either way, I mean, they were on, they were on pace to get Sam Howell sacked for a historic number. And now, even though it's still not great, it's def- four four combined sacks over two weeks. That uh, that sounds normal. Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> and we'll we'll take normal over uh, that specific NFL record. Yeah, like it was literally record breaking. Is the trajectory that they were on uh, for that? Selby, I can't thank you enough. You know, you were our first big guest on here. We've always loved and appreciated the time you've taken out for us over the years. You know, you, on a whim's notice, you come on and be able to talk with us, and we've always appreciated you, sir. I hope you have a great evening. You know, until next time, brother. I really do appreciate it, and have a good week. Of course, y'all the homies. Y'all take it easy, my man. Yes, have a good night, Selby. It. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> yep, All right, everybody. We just spoke with a man, Mr. Zach Selby. Always appreciate talking to Zach. Thank you for blessing us with your presence, Reed. How are you doing? <laughs> Don't get used to it. Don't I know. I, I never do. That's why it's just like you're just a ghost. You know, a white guy wearing a white shirt. You're just a spooky ghost now. <laughs> Ooh, it's yeah. not spooky season anymore. You can't say it. Ah, it's you're right. Season. It is Christmas. If season anything, now. that was just that was just offensive. <laughs> yeah, I saw you got your tree up, dude. That is. Uh, thank you. I've been getting into it. Lindsay, Lindsay says that I was going to get beat spook- if I didn't. She, you know what? She says she spooky used? season doesn't end till Thanksgiving. I'm like Christmas, dude. I'm I'm like da 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 da. All I want, I don't want. You know what Katie, you know what Katie did? <laughs> she used she used my son to be able to do it. She like asked Cash. She's like, Cash, do you want to set up the Christmas tree? And he was like, Oh, oh yeah. Okay. That's and then she's like, How you want to yeah. go get the stuff? And Got like, him. Damn. Yeah. Damn. You're like, I can't say what. Then you'd be the Grinch, dude. Yeah, you I should. Know. You should do that. You should just dress <laughs> yourself in green, come down the chimney. I should. <laughs> and he, he honestly yeah. wouldn't blink an eye. He'd be like, Okay, yeah, that makes like, sense. Cool. But That's let hey, before we are joined by our next guest, let's do some uh, game beers. I, this obviously is needed for this team. It's the red, white, and dub episode. They won twenty to seventeen. So Hall, if you'd like to start us off. Who's getting your game beer? Um, I'm going to have to say, got to go with my man, Jahan Dotson, with the touchdown. I believe he had four catches, five, four catches, 66 yards, I believe it was, and a touchdown. And four receptions <clears throat> for 69 yards, giggity. 69 One yards, touchdown yeah. and eight targets. He was the highest, most targeted receiver yesterday. And I like that he's getting targeted a lot more, and – Seems like he's getting more involved in the offense for the last two weeks, and hopefully he keeps up this uh, the pace that he's on as far as like being involved in the offense and uh, making the plays downfield. And so, my guy Jahan Dotson, got to give it to him. Uh, for me, a guy that's getting a game beer, I think, is Charles Leno. Um, I, Charles Leno, I saw him play with a lot of effort yesterday. He was very physical, and that's not something you typically see out of Charles Leno. And I really appreciate that, especially on screens and other things like that. You saw, I saw a big difference with Charles in the way he played, and you kind of saw that with the offensive line in general and the way that they conducted themselves out on the perimeter. They were very effective in the screen game on the wide uh, stretch plays and everything. They did a very good job yesterday. And Charles Leno, you deserve a beer, sir. Kick your feet up. You kicked ass yesterday. Reed, yeah. who's getting your Bud Light of the a week? Uh, I'm going to go with Emmanuel Forbes. Just a bounce back game, dude. I know everybody could say, well, it was against the Patriots. What terrible wide receiver core. It doesn't matter. The dude needed a confidence boost, and he got it. He was targeted seven times, uh, only allowed two catches for 12 yards, broke up four passes, and he was our highest rated player, according to PFF. He had a, over 90. He had a, what, 91.3 grade? Shout out to Emmanuel Ford, man. What a good bounce back. He's going to need it, too, because next week's going to be tough. Imagine him versus DK Metcalf. Yeah. And I think that, I it's think like it the was, size of DK like, Metcalf's leg. Yeah, it's going to be like Kyle and that guy from last weekend. <laughs> that so, but let's, let's be obvious here. Uh, Sam Howell deserves a game beer. I mean, I, you can't stress yeah, it obviously. enough. I, I think we would all say that. And the only reason we haven't picked him yet is because I think it's blatantly obvious 
the kid, the run on the the twenty three yard run, dude, that was so by nice. itself, yeah. and then the throws that he made to Jahan to Terry, the one throwing off his back foot, throwing back it foot to, Terry to Terry at the sideline. Oh yeah. my goodness! I mean, it's just what you what you're seeing, and I, I talked about this. The best play of the game by Sam Howell, in my opinion, was that New England had sent a corner blitz. And through the preseason and early on in the season, you saw that kind of get to Sam Howell where either he was getting hit from behind, wasn't paying attention, or was late to see it and was kind of panicking. At this time, he saw the blitzer come in from that left side, and he, calm as day, just tossed it right over him to A.G., who was who he was going to that blitzer zone, which kind of stretches the defense, which allows A.G. to move. Uh, that is the progression of Sam Howe as a, an adult quarterback. You see Pat Mahomes, you see Tom Brady, or you did see Tom Brady making that. As soon as that blitzer comes, they're throwing right to that outlet, and that is what the great quarterbacks do. And so, Sam Howe, you deserve a beer. Progress, brother. You guys have anybody else you want to add to the game beer list? Uh, I'll say Antonio Gibson because yeah, it wasn't like a big statistical day as far as like the numbers go, but – Averaged over five yards in carry. I believe he averaged like seven yards a catch out the backfield. Six carries, making... 34 yards, five receptions for 42 yards on five targets. Caught all the passes. Yes, sir. And then, like I said, he was making dudes miss. It seemed like he was running with like a purpose. He was running angry, stiff-arming guys. Like I said, shaking dudes, so spin moves. So definitely uh, haven't seen that type of AG as far as like the receptions and the rushes since maybe like 2020, maybe 2021-ish. So definitely love the way they use them, and hopefully they're going to kind of keep him in that mold of the guy out there, that Jared McKinnon role, like Kansas City used uh, use them last year. Need some coffee, Reed. Uh, are you going to save us? Who's getting the last game beer from you? Any honorable men- Not honorable mention. I, there's one guy left. There are truly des- two guys that deserve it. I mean, I, I was just going to go with Kendall Fuller. Kendall Fuller Quan making that Martin, play towards man. the end of the game. Yeah, but hey, that play wouldn't have happened without Kendall Fuller. But no, Quan Martin, of course, shout out to him too. I mean, he played a lot more. Uh, he, he got the game ceiling pick, but that pick doesn't happen unless Kendall Fuller doesn't make that play on that ball. And, and Kendall's... You know why that play happened? It's because of TikTok. That was a TikTok pick. That's yeah. what that was. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I, I'm surprised Quan Martin doesn't hit the Quan after every interception. He should <laughs> I was running around my my mom's house yesterday. Hit the Quan. The the funny thing is that Quan has been moved all over too. Obviously, he split. He plays special teams, but he almost got home on a blitz at one point, which just missed um uh Mac Jones's hand as he was delivering a football and then you see him get that pick in the safety so you kind of can see him being used all over the field it's not like he's just special teams and brought in every now and again he's utilized with uh and obviously a structure to it and there's a plan involved which is always great to see for Quan because you want him to get those more points I know that Tim Towner had wrote in our discord that the all the draft picks from defensively were on the field for that pick Quan Martin, Emmanuel Forbes, KJ Henry, and Andre Jones were on the field, which is awesome to absolutely hear about that. Uh, but let, before we are joined by our next guest, let's answer some fan questions. And this one was submitted by the Colonel. Reed, this is his question to you, sir. As crazy as it sounds, could trading Young and Sweat have been the catalyst this team needed to provide more of a sense of urgency to win? Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. The only thing... Is will it translate to wins? I don't know. I mean, we faced a pretty. I mean, New England. Like, look, I know that they're New England. Their defense is alright, but they're not. They're they're not that good. Um, and usually we play down to our our opponents, so that's impressive. But we didn't generate any pressure off of the edges the entire game. I, I mean, that that's just it is what it is. And can they can they overcome that? Hopefully, uh, against some of these better teams because they do want to make a late season push. But it's going to be. I do think that this is going to tell a lot of guys to hunker down. Like this is we got these distractions gone, whatever it may be, whether it's new deals, what, but uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting to see. Uh, these guys definitely got to step up. Yes, they do. And is, is the, yes, they obviously was a catalyst and sort of an excitement of just something being done. Right. Cause you kind of could talk about all these different things. I'm not, I'm not going to say that they're happy about them leaving. I think maybe some people might be not sure. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hear sit here and say it's true or not. All I'm going to say is, it kind of makes the it kind of makes everyone fall into place more. It just seems like there was a social barricade or sort of in place where people couldn't really be themselves. And I think maybe this like you saw this defense kind of like actually feel comfortable. 
for once. And besides that, obviously, that 64-yard run, which was absolutely crazy. Um, would you feel sorry for Percy Butler for being put on the island like that? But that's why you play safety, dude. You're the last line of defense. And a lot of credit to Cam Curl for ch trying to chase him down. He was on the opposite side of the field, and he tried to chase that dude down and met him at the goal line. So a lot of respect to him. But they already know that there's an urgency to win. I don't think this. I don't think John Allen, any of these guys, want to lose, man. I don't think they're looking forward to losing or hoping that things get changed. I think that the urgency to win is there. It's just being able to put it all together for 60 minutes, man. That's all. Yeah, I don't think there was like a new sense of urgency or anything like that because there's always been a sense of urgency since the beginning. season began because of the whole new ownership. Is Rivera going to be here next year? Is it a lame duck year and whatnot? So these guys knew what it was coming into the year as far as they got to win if they wanted to keep Coach Rivera around and whoever else and – yeah, I mean, it's NFL. Like, you're trying to go out and win every game, and everyone knows that, like, it's basically a week-to-week -week game, a week-to-week -week league, and a what-have-you-done-for-me-now-lately league. And everyone's got to go out there and put your best uh, best uh, play on tape for – if you're not going to be for the next coaching regime, if not for another coaching regime from the other 31 right. teams out there. So, uh, like I said, I don't think it was a catalyst or, a, like, a new sense of urgency. I just think that – like, again, I think guys just felt a lot more – like you said, I guess a lot more comfortable and just ready to like, let's just get past this dr last little bit of drama and mm. move forward with the uh, Patriots game. Yeah, and oh speaking, God, now I gotta go. Yeah, and speaking of drama, we got <laughs> we got Washington's favorite punching bag, Mr. Nick Acreage from Pro Football Focus. Thank you so the much for Kirk blessing Cousins. us on this victory Monday, Nick. How are you doing? I'm good. Every every time they win, my mentions are are ten thousand times better. It goes from it goes from PFF sucks. You're completely wrong when we lose to. Yep. Huh? Why is that grade like that? Can you explain? It's just the mood is. But a lot just, meaner. Yeah. It's so <laughs> much nicer words. when they win. Yeah. So and I, I just like you said, I'm the punchy bag, and I'll take it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, you can, Nick. But speaking of, I want to get your opinion of the unsung hero of the game. Not necessarily maybe like a hero meaning in production, but somebody who doesn't get a lot of attention, but somebody that was very important and it was a big catalyst in the in getting the dub yesterday. Antonio Gibson. That guy yes. kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, it, it looked like he was never going to see the field again. Chris Rodriguez was starting to take some snaps and then kind of came out of nowhere and had one of the – had his best game of the season for sure and one of the best in his career. Just kind of kept making plays. Oh. Uh, I thought Drew was going to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we talked know. about uh, we talked about Emmanuel Forbes. Obviously, he uh, made his comeback yesterday. Even though it was against a, a wide receiver core like New England Patriots, who a don't really have PFF a wide grade. Woo. Yeah, he had a high, really high PFF grade. Just talk about what you saw from him, and do you think he's going to be able to carry that over going up against this trio in Seattle? Yeah, it's. I mean, like you said, it's not. It's not a great wide receiver core. Um, it's pretty rough. But if he had a rough game against a rough receiving core, it'd be we'd we'd be starting to freak out a little bit. Mm. Um, this was really, really good to see. Um, it's something that'll give him confidence in a cornerback position. Half of it's confidence. Like if you just are a little more confident, it just it just helps you extra like so much. And it was really, really good to see. He was targeted seven times, two catches for twelve yards, and four forced incompletions. That's like that's what you really want to see is that's the ball hawking, the the playmaking ability that that people were kind of touting, you know, pre draft and whatnot. And and that's what you really like to see. And we just, you know, we we move on and we hope it hope it continues. I don't think it's gonna be a repeat of a ninety one grade, whatever next week. He's gonna have a much, much tougher <laughs> task. But um, never know, Nick. You never know. It's definitely a step in the right direction, though, that's for sure. Yeah, and also shout out to like Cam Curl and Benjamin St. Juice after the game tweeting out that like they're like 13s really like that. Like he's so that's got to be huge for him, at least mm -hmm. like uh, confidence wise. But so what has been the difference with Sam Howell these last two weeks? Has it been Eric Bieniemy's play calling? Has it been the offensive line? What, what's what's going on there? Nick, elaborate too. Give me it's, a very uh, in-depth answer. It's <laughs> it's a bit of it's a bit of play calling and it mixed with Howell being a lot quicker. It's there's so much more quick game now. There's so much more screens involved. There's there's just a ton of easy throws out there for him, and he's making them, and he's making the right decision over and over and over again. And it's easy to just say, oh, he's just, you know, dinking and dunking it, but you still have to make the right decision. So 
That's why the PFF grade is a little bit lower than some might have suspected over the past couple of years. There's a lot of shorter throws. Um, so that's just kind of the thing. And it, the offensive line, is it's still struggling a little bit. The interior is still struggling a little bit. Um, there was a lot of a lot of free rushers, a lot of stunts that weren't picked up <clears throat> on Sunday. Um, but the game plans have just gotten so much better, just getting the ball out of his hands. And now that he kind of gets more comfortable with that, you see the playmaking ability come and, and he's able to escape some pressure and really kind of, you know, show off his skills, his arm talent, his missed tackle ability, which I, I don't, I still, I'll never understand it. it. It's the same thing with like Terry McLaurin. I'll never understand how he catches the ball because he catches it with his chest. Okay. It doesn't make any sense. The okay. way Sam Howell can make people miss tackles in the open field doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. He runs like a bowling ball and it just, he just somehow people can't tackle him. He led the nation in, in forced missed tackles his senior year as a quarterback. Um, and, and now he's just, he's doing it again. So when he gets out in the open field, it's, it's really impressive stuff. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. My question in depth on offense and defense, Washington was very good on third down. Offensively, they were nine of 17, which is a step in the right direction for them. They held New England to three of 12 on third down. But the crazy thing is, Nick, it wasn't like they were short third downs for the offense and it wasn't like they were long third downs for the defense. They were very effective on third down yesterday. What did you notice about that? What is what is making the third downs click at the moment? Right now, it's it goes back to the Sam Howell playmaking. Like there, there were there were plenty of plays that nothing was open originally, and he's forced to make a play, and he's done it. Now, sometimes we'll see in in coming weeks where that's not going to work out. He's going to try to make a play, and it's not going to work out. It's just kind of the nature of, of quarterback play. But um, they were on the same page together, wide receivers and him. And when it turns into scramble drill, it's backyard football. It's just get open, trust your guy, and and make some plays. And the, that one throw where he threw it completely across his body. Um, was one of the craziest throws I've ever seen, but was actually an incredible play um, just because I don't know how he knew there was a coverage bust. Maybe he didn't, and I'm giving him too much credit. Um, <laughs> but it's just an incredible throw, and, and the arm strength to do that while while falling away is just incredible. Yeah, I thought that one throw to Terry McLaurin on the sideline as he's falling away with the blitzer coming at him and just drops it right there to the sideline to the point where the announcers didn't even think it was a catch. I'm sitting here, mm -hmm. he's got two feet in bounds. What a throw that was. Never doubt Terry. It always Never. comes down with it. Well, yeah. When in doubt, uh, throw it to Terry. Unless it's, unless it's against the Eagles and the games. On the uh, who <laughs> asked you? I, I, it's All Terry. Right. It's who Terry. asked I'll you? Just like to throw that out there. I'm just kidding. I love Terry. You can do no wrong unless he's uh, you know, dropping. Why are the NFL referees so bad, and why did they rob KJ Henry of his first sack? It's a it's, lack of common sense, right? That was such it's a, a yeah. It's it's bad. I think it's it's some of the worst officiating, and and just all over the league. Like it, it's so bad. I mean, there's, there's a play every single, in every single game where it's just like, what are we, what are we doing here? Like you said, common sense has to overrule it. Like he is hitting him with his shoulder in his back. Like I, I, I He's don't rolling understand. off of him. He's not putting his weight on him. He <laughs> did everything over. perfectly right there. And, and it doesn't make it. And there were so many more questionable calls throughout the entire game. I mean, Washington yeah. probably got away with some defensive holdings. Right. Patriots got away with some defensive holding on some downfield throws. Like it is just so bad throughout the entire league we saw the josh allen intentional grounding thing that one's more of it's a dumb rule than anything else but it was just it's so bad throughout the entire league and these guys don't have any repercussions for it so there's no reason to really fix it like they're just out there yeah. they don't get fined or anything and it's just it's just crazy the crazy thing nick it's almost like these are like police officers that are literally going by the book on every single inch like you have you ever seen harold and kumar when they jaywalk across the street at like 12 yeah. o'clock at night and the guy, yeah. there's no cars, he writes them up a ticket. It's almost what it's like. It's like, I understand why you have the rule in place, but you have to be able to differentiate what is actually going to cause injury and what isn't, you know? Yeah. If, officiating is in a very, very bad spot. And when you, when you chart as many plays as I do for PFF, you see a lot of things that go miss, like terrible spots, um, just missed penalties downfield that you'll never, like there is, People say there's holding on every single play. There's illegal contact on every single play yep. in the secondary, every single <laughs> every play. Single and it's play. just whether or not at whether or not they want to call it. I mean, it, yeah. it's it's a strange rule because it happens every single play. And, and sometimes it's OK, sometimes it's not. And it's really kind of up to the ref if, if they feel like calling. It. And same with holding. Like there is holding every single play. And it's just it's it's in a bad spot right now. It's, and it's 2023. I feel like we need to get a little more. A little better with this. It's just, how well, it's just how well you can hide it, I guess. That's all <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. So this offensive line combo, obviously, uh, with uh, Paul and, and Larson replacing Gates and Charles, is that 
are they playing as good as people are making it out to be, or are they really contributing to the fact that St. Mal has been sacked? I know you've, this has been hotly debated with you. <laughs> what do you say, Nick? Yeah, I've been, uh, been yelled at for, for ever mm-hmm. over this. Essentially these past two weeks has been, um, just so people just yelling at me about offensive line play. <laughs> um, so but funny. if you watch it, if you watch the film <laughs> and, and you're looking at the interior, the interior two, really, um, it's not gotten, it's gotten a little bit better, but it's still, there are still a lot of free rushers out there. Um, and like I said earlier, the, the play calling's better. Sam Howell is quicker and that masks a lot of it. I mean, offensive line play is, um, is judged based on the quarterback play from, from fans. Like if the quarterback's getting the ball out, they don't, from they the don't common, care the from the common folk. I'm not going to, you said it. I didn't, <laughs> I'm not better than anyone else. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's just you have to you have to rewatch, and and that's that's tough. I mean, uh, the casual fans just watching on Sunday, and they're they're going off of that, and that's perfectly fine. I have no yeah. problem with that. Right. But um, th- there are plenty of plays out there where you know it, it could be a problem if if Sam doesn't get the ball out quicker, he doesn't make someone miss. Um, and I, I think Larson is doing a better job than than Gates when it comes to you know setting protections. But I don't know how much of that is on his plate or on Howell's plate. Um, he's doing a much better job there, but there were, there were a ton of stunts that weren't picked up um, just right through that a gap on the left side between, between Paul and Paul and Larson there. So um, I'll stop now before more people start hating. Me. <laughs> yeah. If you didn't think it was bad before, just wait till after they hear this and you're calling them stupid too, Nick. I mean, right. Right. See, see the YouTube comments. On Thanks Reed. Uh, I've had a, I've had a lot of peasants. good comments on Twitter, so I, I, I'll take it. To wrap this up, Nick, I only have a couple more questions for you, but um Break down that red zone interception by how I know it's going to be very easy, just a really dumb decision on his part, but kind of try to explain it if you were how in a way. Yeah, I think that's might be the toughest question you've ever asked me. I don't know how to even <laughs> possibly explain that decision. Um, <laughs> Let's see. It's I mean, maybe he tried to throw it away and the ball slipped. I, I don't know. That's the best Took thing. Took a sheet do. of acid before the game and thought one of the he, Patriots was a commander. You no, know, he thought he was like, what would Reed do here? What would yeah. Reed do? It was rough, and it, it, it really it sucks because that one pick really massed a pretty incredible performance. And I think he's the best that, of his career. That drive um, was good, too, like leading yeah, up to that The drive was point. great. I mean, yeah. it sucks. Um, and that one that one play kind of really tanked his grade a little bit. It, we gave him the, the harshest grade you can give a quarterback on a play, a minus two for that one. Um, and I don't know if many people will debate me for that. I haven't gotten a lot of hate for the Sam Howell grade, so that's, that's kind of that's nice. But, um, yeah, I think it just kind of – really put a little little sour note on on a really really great performance but i think he's taken some incredible steps in the right direction and uh, i do love that we're talking about you know an interception and, and big time throws and all that sort of stuff instead of sacks over and over and over again <laughs> yeah <laughs> nobody likes that except for reed sacks. um but uh, um to love branch, ball sacks to branch <laughs> <laughs> to branch off of that, Nick, uh, to what you were saying, I think the play calling could have helped a little bit there. They had three timeouts. I know there's only 25 seconds left, but you could still run the ball with on the five-yard line because they're not expecting mm-hmm. it. They're expecting a pass. You could have yeah. taken advantage there and taken some weight off of Sam's shoulders because it was pass after pass after pass. But that being said, how are you feeling about Eric Bieniemy as a play caller? I see him growing and blo- blossoming right now, and he's got this offense humming and scoring points. Yeah, I, they're playing really well against two really good defense. Like the Patriots are a, a very good defense. Eagles are a very good defense, and he's he's gotten them to score a lot of points, put up a lot of yards. We're missing, you know. There's there's some fine details that you can obviously improve on. I it, it's weird that I'm saying this, but I would like to see a little more run game. Um, it's weird as an analytical PFF guy, they want to run the run the ball, I guess. But I think he he's fallen into that Andy Reid Chiefs kind of thing where they get way too cute on third and fourth down. I think that's the one thing that stopped the Chiefs offense over the year is they get crazy cute when it comes to third and one plays and fourth and one plays. That's where you see, again, we saw it uh, at the beginning of this last game. They tried to uh, design shovel pass that was completely blown up instead of just, you know, handing the ball off or just sneaking, sneak the ball. Uh, I'll go to my grave saying just sneak it every time, third and one, fourth and one. If they stop you twice, tip your cap and move on. But they get a little too cute. They try to shovel pass on third and one, got completely blown up and you, you lose like three yards. You don't have a chance to, to go for it at that point. So yeah, I respect Vilma a lot, but he kept saying it was due to the high snap. And I was like, dude, if you watch 91, he blows that play completely <laughs> yeah. up. 
You can you can look at Logan Thomas. He's coming across looking into the backfield, which means he's ready for a shovel pass. You're never going to look in the backfield if you're pulling on a on some sort of counter or right. power play. Um, but yeah, it was. It's just that that's my only one gripe is sometimes it gets a little too cute. All right, and last question I have for you: How awesome was that Terry McLaurin catch and run? It's pretty good. Uh, that I mean, was it's, beautiful. It's it's always good. Just get the just get the ball in his hands. I know. I mean, I'm speaking for my fantasy team. I'm speaking for um, <laughs> for a lot of people here. But just get the ball in his hands. Good things. Good things always happen when he touches the ball. I'm with um, you. Last, but last right? one I have. It's a good one. If you were the GM right now, Nick and Josh Harris and Magic Johnson sat you down and they said Nick Acreage should Sam Howell start Week One next season, what do you say? Um, give it some time. I know you're gonna. <laughs> there is no time. <laughs> Yeah, the time is now. Time is now. I would, I would, I'm leaning very, very slightly to go with him next year. Very, very slightly. There's a lot that can change. Very, very slightly. Very, very slightly leaning towards how. <laughs> All right. All right. I know All I'm right. not going out on much of a limb there, but again, we don't need to make I got these you. I got crazy you. declarative statements saying like, we got to go with him. And then next week, if he has a terrible game, it's going to be like, move on from how. Yeah. It's all, it's all a it's week to week. More games. Week to week, need more games, assess at the end of the year, and if there's any questions, maybe move on. But one, I, these past two weeks have been have been great and just keep going from there. The one the one thing is like think about the last 20 years as fans. No quarterback on third down ever threw it past the chains. It always pissed us off. <laughs> Sam comes in there, he's dropping dimes on third down uh, past the chains. And it's like, the right, young, Sam? it's the young quarterback syndrome that fans have, especially with with teams that have not had franchise quarterbacks. You, you look at yeah. the Bears, you look at Washington, you look at the Bills before Josh Allen, you look at any of these teams, it's always they're always going to look to make, you know, excuses and and look for the bright side in absolutely everything and they're going to hate criticism of him. Um but the criticism was warranted for the first couple of weeks. These past 2 weeks he's put a lot of that to 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 doubt and um I think we're moving in the right direction. It's going to it's going to take a, a whole season for me to really evaluate him. I know you, you might ask me every single week, and I might give you the same answer every single week. But um, so Pat, yeah, I, I just it so, should it shouldn't just be like let's give it to him. So according to Nick Acreage, Sam Howell's the next Pat Mahomes. It's what I wanted to hear, man. That's all I wanted to hear, Nick. <laughs> Nick, I can't thank you enough for joining us, I don't man. Think he said As that. always, uh, being able to take a break from your daily life, <laughs> getting beat up by everybody on Twitter uh, just for doing your job and doing a good job at it. Uh, before we get out of here, just like plug your social media handle, just in case anybody watching hasn't followed you yet, would like to, sir. Yeah, yeah. just in case anyone watching is, has not yelled at me in the comments yet, it's uh, <laughs> at pff underscore Nick at Acreage Acreage, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I just just come yell at me. Uh, it's <laughs> we, it's been a good day. It's been a good day today. So maybe if they lose next week, I'll get. Some Which is? Money, but. Do you even know how to pronounce your last name? Which is it? Is it Acreage or is it Acreage? I feel like it should be pronounced. It should be pronounced Acreage because there's no C before the K. Right. But like I go by I go by Acreage. I don't really care. My whole life it was teachers say Acreage. Well, what do your um, parents so. say? Acreage. Okay, so it's Ackridge. That's what we'll go with. We're going to go with that. <laughs> Nick, I can't think right. enough, man. Have a great victory Monday. Enjoy Monday Night Football, brother. All right. See you guys. All right, brother. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Nick Acreage from Pro Football Focus. Absolutely crazy it's, to it's hear Ackridge. that Emmanuel Forbes had the 91 rating. You know, typically that 91 doesn't come around. Obviously, you could talk about all, like, the competition level. I'm not going to disrespect them. Douglas was playing his ass off yesterday for New England. That dude was effective. But dude, to, he's been good this season. Yeah. To wrap up he's with our fan good. questions, this one from the Colonel Hall. Please comment on the play of Quan Martin and Emmanuel Forbes. Both made some mistakes yesterday, but Martin got his first interception of the season, and Forbes almost had a pick. Do they need to stay in there to develop and learn from those errors? Yeah, it's always about the more reps you get, the better you should get. Like, I'm not going to say every player, the more reps they get, the better they get. But it seems like, especially with Quan Martin, he started off with special teams, getting reps there. He kind of made some flash plays. And then if you go back to the beginning of the season, I, I know a lot of fans were – they were down on Quan Martin because he was getting beat, getting burned here and there, missing tackles. But it seems like with the more reps he's getting, the more confidence he's getting, and the better he's getting, and the more uh, – like I said, the more he's uh, flashing on the screen – during the games. And as far as Emmanuel Forbes goes, like everyone's talked about cornerback for the most part is about confidence. And it seems like for a little bit, Emmanuel Forbes might've lost his confidence, but hopefully uh, playing against, I know like, like everyone said, the competition wasn't 
as great as it's going to be throughout the whole rest of the season. But it's a confidence builder. It's just like with Sam Howe. It's about stacking games, stacking plays, stacking drives and whatnot. So as long as he, as long as he keeps stacking games, stacking plays, stacking good plays, like you're a cornerback you're in the NFL, you're going to get beat once in a while. Like it's going to happen. Nobody never gets beat in the NFL. But as long as you're able to bounce back from it, I think he'll be fine. So I think they're both going to be fine. And, yeah, they're definitely uh, two bright spots that were uh, out there on Sunday. Hopefully they'll keep uh, shining. Yeah, and Emmanuel Forbes, he had three tackles, two passes, deflep, uh, deflections uh, per ESPN. One thing is they didn't put in the tackle for loss, and I thought that he did that on one uh, check down or as a screen or something of the sort. He did a, he should have been a tackle for loss there. But, yeah, they need more playing time in order to continue to build up that cohesion with their teammates to kind of really put pen to paper, so to speak. Um, with Emmanuel Forbes, he's still playing a little bit sloppy at times. Um, and with his footwork, just hit, the way he's conducting himself. But when you see on that slant and you see him approaching that football, it's like perfect form. And you see that and it's just you want him to be able to go about that same technique and everything that he does on a, every single play. And because what he's realizing is on those plays that you aren't 100% focused in, you're not 100%, you are looking a little bit sloppy, somebody's going to see that and they're going to exploit it, which has happened before. And so it's like, yeah, you want to build that confidence, but always keep in the back of your mind that they're always looking for that opportunity for you to slip up. Now let's go to our uh, Twitter for our next fan question. Reed, this is from Tony Franchise. He says, it seems the O-line has been playing much better since Larson has been at center. I noticed that he has been better at calling protection. What do you think? I think so too. I think you can go back uh, throughout Larson's entire tenure here and say that Larson's done a very good job. The team's played better when Larson's been in there. That's just can't even really debate that at this point. So I, I think that, yes, I think you got to continue to roll with him. Nothing against Nick Gates. Nick Gates has become one of my favorite players with how he's got all of his guys back. Play on the field, that was a little bit frustrating. So having, having Larson back there and look, like Nick said, is he really playing that much better? I don't know, but uh, it, you, it, something's contributing to Sam Howell not getting sacked as much, and it's got to start with the center. Yeah, PFF, man. I, I should have yelled at Nick because they gave uh, Tyler <laughs> Larson in enough. a 22 he, grade in fake pass account protection. And yell at him on Twitter. They gave him a 22 <laughs> grade in pass protection. So it's hard to say that like they're being better with – like I, I think it's unfair to them to say that – that Nick Gates and Sidney Charles were the reason why the offensive line was doing it. I think it was an accumulative. I think a lot of people had their hand in that. And I think that they all they made the right moves when they needed to. Everything happens for a reason. And I don't think it's – like, honestly, if you were to plug in Nick Gates and take Larson out right now, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're going to start giving up pressures again. You know, a lot of them, you know, because they, they already are. But maybe there is a difference there. And it's just right now the recipe is working and you want to keep that recipe going as long as possible as you possibly can. Because right now, Leno, the entire line is playing well. Nobody's, I haven't heard anybody complaining about Wiley and needing to be shipped out. I'm, I'm sure there's somebody out there still complaining about him, but he's not. Well, we know one person. Me. We know one person on Twitter that's still campaigning for that. Yeah, I don't know who you're talking about. Oh, you know. No, I don't. His name is Spark Ryler. Oh, yeah, we're blocked. Yeah, we're blocked, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit, really? <laughs> I, I could have I guessed that. I'm but... blocked because of Reed, but it's okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was your decision, but okay. Anyway, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but let's go to our Discord for the next round of fan questions. Kyle sent me after him. Kyle said, <laughs> Kyle said stuck the dog on him. Kyle said, get him. I don't like him. Sick him. Sick him. <laughs> And I said, yes, yes. Paul, this yes, question master. from Big Tony Shivers. When you take a step back, isn't it good that we that we question now are just football-related stuff, coaching tactics, play calls, roster management, play on the field, etc., and not ownership scandals or Bruce Allen saying dumb stuff? A new world, he says. What do you think, Paul? There's still time. No, I'm just kidding. No, I mean, there's definitely uh, – no, no, it definitely feels good. I mean – me and Cracky, uh, our, our boy Kevin, aka Cracky, we're going back and forth because uh, whenever they decided to like bench Jimmy Garoppolo and all this other stuff and fire Josh McDaniels, I put in the group chat like, "Man, it feels good to not be the worst franchise in the NFL anymore." And of course, he started going back and forth like, "Oh, like blah, blah, blah. just because you're not the worst doesn't mean you're much you better." Us in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I was like, oh, just because you're not the worst doesn't mean you're not the you're that much better. And it was just pretty much he was trying to make himself feel better, but. Long story short, yes, it feels great. It feels um, 
Yeah, it feels good. I mean, honestly, the only really real drama coming down the pipe is going to be once, Ron, I mean, probably once Ron Rivera gets fired and the whole front office and whatnot, and it'll be that whole off season of who's the next coach, who's the GM, and blah, 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 blah. But, again – that's normal football stuff, which is like crazy to see and crazy to think about. But here we are, 2023. Yep. And I think you're right, a new world. I think you're correct in that saying that, Tony. One thing I will say, I watched Sam Howell's presser, and it's cool to see Sam Howell making jokes, especially like when he actually laughed when referencing the interception he threw, saying it was like the worst play that he's ever made in his football career. And that that's healthy to see. And But also on the flip side of him making jokes to the media and making them laugh, you see him taking command of the podium up there, and not just in the just the sense of just to say it, you know what I mean? But he's taking control of the position and everything that it entails. And you're really starting to see this kid blossom. And I, so to that, Tony, I'll say that not only do we have a new era or are we not t- worried about off-the-field issues or the stadium falling apart or anything like that, we also have a quarterback here who's playing incredibly well for the first time in our literal lives. We have never had a quarterback play like this with this sort of promise and hope for the future. Let's just enjoy the moment to your to your point, Tony. Real fast, imagine imagine that conversation with Biennemi coming off the field after that interception. You know Biennemi was just like, what, what, what the fuck was that? And Sam was like, I don't know. I have no idea what that was. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> it would be so funny. Now, this next question from Chris Comerton Reed. How do you guys feel about Caleb Williams in a Giants uniform next year? Um, so look, I love Caleb Williams as a prospect, as a player. Obviously, I've been a huge Caleb Williams guy, as a lot of people have. Caleb Williams in the New York media would get destroyed. He seems like he's and I'm not just saying this because he cried on his mom. I thought it was kind of cute. But he, I've got the sense from Caleb over like the last two years, just from following him on Instagram. Dude isn't exactly the most stable, can't take criticism the best necessarily. New York media, the moment that goes wrong, he's going to have a tough time. Yeah, your microphone just cut out. He's just gonna a have a bit. tough time. Yeah, yeah. yeah there I right. heard that part. Good job, dude. Yeah, you did. Um, I agree with you because I remember, like Zach Wilson. I said he got driven to training camp by his mom in the back of his minivan. You know, he wasn't even sitting up front. You know what he was and doing? And he really expect this dude to lead a group of men? Like, come on, bro. There's a lot of people <laughs> can be looking at you sideways like that. But uh, more credit to Caleb Williams. You know, if he goes to the Giants, he goes to the Giants. You know, I said it weeks ago that we were not the only ones that were dreading that. Daniel Jones contract and look where we are now. Now the next question from Jeff Miles in the Discord hall. Anyone worried that Terry McLaurin hasn't had a single hundred yard game yet? Uh no, because although it'll it'll probably happen before the season's over, but he's still on pace. I think right now, I think I think it might have been Grant Paulson put up all the receivers what they're on pace for. He's still on pace for over a thousand yards, which so even without a 100-yard game so far throughout the season, he's still on pace for over 1,000 yards, just barely, which he'll clip clips over 1,000 again for, I think, like the fourth year straight or something like that, four out of five years or whatever it might have been so far. So, um, yeah, I'm not that worried about it. And also, at the end of the day, if you really look at Sam and, like, what he's been doing with the offense, he's been playing, like, that point guard role. He's spreading the ball out to, like, I think it was nine different receivers in the first half yesterday. Yep. So – Although I would love seven, and, seven, or seven, yeah, it might have been nine overall, but seven. Um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, like as long as he's getting the targets and he's getting the opportunities to go down the field, make the plays, and the opportunities to like get those uh, yards after the catch, and uh, that we've all like been watching for years, I'm okay with it because at the end of the day, he's gonna break one free. He almost broke one. Yesterday, he would have had over 100 yards. Such so, a you know, it's like freaking play, bro. I feel like it's just like that Jahan Dotson thing where it's like you can see where it's like, all right, he keeps dropping these wide open passes. Eventually, he's going to catch one. He's going he's gonna to take it to the house or he's going to make a move and take it to the house. I just feel like with Terry, there's going to be one where he's going to take a slant 80 yards down the field. It might be against Seattle this week. Who knows? But I think it's it'll be on the horizon. It's coming. But uh, yeah, I think it mostly has to do with Sam just distributing the ball to literally everyone on the field, no matter who it is. Yeah, we'll wait for the Seattle talk on Thursday, but, you know, Seattle has a damn good secondary, and so we're going to have to get creative in that sense. But I'm not worried about Terry McLaurin not having a single 100-yard game yet. I'm more worried about the dubs. I'm more worried about getting to above 500, taking control. And I'm sure 
Terry is too. Uh, Terry just wants to win. What, what, like, if you you don't ask, think he's gonna scrub his whole like Twitter, Instagram, and yeah. all that, and be like, say free me, I'm like just George. Saying, Pins? like, if you were I'm to ask saying, Terry man. right now, if you, he could trade previous seasons, all the success he's had in previous seasons, to with winning playoff games and and actually winning football games, what he'd say. And you'd rather win football games, right? So no, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I'm. Sure. I heard he unfollowed Ron Rivera and Sam Howe and the GM and everybody else because. You know, free, free me, he, free me. I've heard he took his uh, hat out of the secret Santa pool this year. Something's going wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he didn't even he didn't even go shake Jahan Dotson's hand when he scored his first touchdown in two years. <laughs> <laughs> he actually he did though. Uh, the next question. I know he did. It was no, he's question. talking about George Pickens. Oh yeah, my Pickens bad, my did bad. that to Deontay Johnson. He's the only person. He, everybody else went and congratulated him. He ran off the field the other way and was like, George Pickens just sitting there pouting like, man, uh, throw me the ball. Now this next question from Tim Towner, with the exception of Buffalo, with five turnovers and Chicago. Chicago, bad coaching on a short week, he says. Washington has been in every game. If injuries increase, we'll struggle to win. If complimentary football breaks out, we could make a run for the playoffs. In the media, we are starting to see articles as to who the next coaching candidate should be. How does that make you feel, Hall? And what do you think the odds are that Ron Rivera is back for the fifth and final year of his contract with Eric Bieniemy and Jack Del Rio? Well, the odds are like 3%. I know I was listening to like 106 today. Everyone's like calling in like, oh, I want them to lose. I want them to keep losing. And pretty much everyone's main reason was, well, if they keep winning and make the playoffs, like Josh Harris might keep Ron Rivera. And it's like, look, I like Ron. I like what he's done here so far as far as like the whole culture and all that. But like short of like NFC championship game, like he's probably going to get fired. So like I'd rather just let them keep. I mean, and also at the end of the day, they're not like a, they're not like the Raiders where they're just like ah whatever we don't like the coach. They're gonna go out and they're gonna fight for Ron. They need like every Sunday, Saturday, whatever the game is. So I'm not really worried about that. But um, yeah, I mean as far as like all like who's the next coach and all that, like I mean that's always been expected. That's been a topic going in since beginning of the year because again everyone just assumed and everyone thinks that this is a lame duck year anyway. So yeah, it's just frustrating because. If you really think about it, if you if they went out, if they went out, beat the teams they're supposed to be handling their business, they'd be six and three right now instead of four and five. And then they we win one in Philly, they're seven and two. But you know it is what it is, and uh, hopefully they'll right the ship and sneak into the playoffs because life's better when you're in the playoffs. I, I want to be even if you're the one and done in the playoffs. I still want Sam Howe to get that that playoff experience, that playoff atmosphere under his belt. So I agree. With you. Yeah. How, how does that make me feel? It makes you feel confused a little bit, Tim. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, I, I think it's wishful thinking to be perfectly honest with you. We don't know how this season's going to shape out. I think it's a little bit early. I think it's too early for draft talk, draft prospects. I haven't even begun to investigate and I will in the obvious future, but I think it's too early for all of that. We're sitting here at four and five and we have a lot of football to be played in front of us. And I think too much time isn't, it, like what Tony had said earlier, we're talking about football things, right? And you don't want to lose sight of that. And just remember that we still got football to be played. And if you, the more you keep looking towards making the changes at the end of the season, the quicker it's going to come for you. And uh, I want to embrace this time and soak it all in and as much as we possibly can, kind of like Reed on the weekends. But that's going to wrap us up for this episode, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. I'm glad that Reed didn't fall asleep tonight. He pulled his best Reed, uh, I mean, Hall impersonation, yawning the entire time. I appreciate you, sir. I literally, I literally yawned like 50 times every episode for the last like three <laughs> years. So I just noticed it. I always feel so rude, too, because I'll do it when like a guest is talking, and it's nothing against them. They don't bore me. Unless Kyle's talking, then I'm like, oh, this is fucking boring. <laughs> but and when they do it, and I, I always feel so bad. I have to like hide it, but. <laughs> yeah, not this time. This time I said, don't care. I know. All right, Wanted to. Thank you for tuning into this episode. It's, if you have gotten this far, you are a champion. I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, oh, we had one reaction. I was sent in a reaction because I asked our Twitter guys, give me one like response. It's like, I guess just your feeling after the game. And Command Town, who sent us the Hallelujah t-shirts, I should probably go get it upstairs. But he said, I drove up to the game from Jersey. I got to say, all the fans that are not happy, I got to say, the fans, they are not happy with Mac Jones at all. Also, a lot of the fans are ready for Belichick to move on. If anyone ever asks you if you want a grinder in New England, they're asking you if you want a sub or a hoagie. 
that yeah. that solves a lot of not that issues. app that you use kyle <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny reed it's not funny it's I mean, not funny I, that's not there's nothing that's that not wrong funny. with it, it was, say there was, was anything wrong with it that was yeah. <laughs> that was good that was good hoagies and grinders all right everybody we will see you guys on thursday we'll have an electric episode for you you don't want to miss it if you made it this far you're champion if you listen to us i really appreciate you guys you guys are awesome all right everybody we'll see you on thursday washington football Woo! Peace. What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with t-shirts, hoodies, and zip-up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.